from Courtside of the Virtual Hardwood, it's the NLSE Podcast. This is episode 462. I am Andrew, Andrew in our forum, and Andrew NLSE on Twitter. Joining me as always, my co-host Derek, DP3 in our forum, and also on Twitter at DP3G and DP384. Derek, are you feeling influential today? I am, and actually I'm going to start off this episode by promoting the NLSE YouTube channel and some of the content that we've put up recently. Uh, If you haven't taken a look uh, this year um, or last year at the NLSE YouTube channel, uh, you're missing out because there's been a lot of gameplay videos going up related to tournaments that have been run through the NLSE on various games like NBA Jam on Fire Edition, NBA Live 10, uh, etc. And we have gameplay videos from all eras of video games i mean we've had you know a double dribble gameplay go up uh super dunk shot yeah we've had nba jam many different versions of that game nba 2k 19 nba 2k 17 2k 14 like you name it and we've been you know putting a gameplay up on the nlc youtube but some recent videos uh, we had the nlc top 10 plays of the week a new edition, which did not disappoint. Uh, an NBA Live 09 for PS2 game highlight video between the 80s All-Stars versus the 70s All-Stars. And Andrew and I uh, connected through Parsec and played co-op using the 80s All-Stars in that game. And we actually had a good time. And we'll be touching on NBA Live 09 on the show and kind of breaking down that PS2 version uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, also, 2K19 All-Time Fantasy Draft game highlight video um magic versus celtics my brother and i playing co-op using the magic andrew with his excellent nba 2k 14 my career story videos one related to eldon jennings the 5'9 dynamo and terry hansen who's also a virtual hardwood legend and that's the title of that video uh and he also has an nba 2k 14 retro series um showcasing some classic matchups using the retro teams and then we also have like nba jam on fire edition road trip action um andrew and i using julia serving and daryl dawkins putting on a dunk show and a nba hang time ps1 full game between the rockets versus the mavericks and that's andrew and i again teaming up me on drexler him on elijah one so there has just been a lot of cool content going up on the nlse youtube and if you haven't checked it out um get on there and check it out expertly promoted sir that was uh, that was fantastic and it, we've been having a lot of fun with that you've been spearheading that content for the last well, over over a year now probably closer to two years with uh, i mean we're into the what third year of the top 10 now so we are on year two, week 37. That's so, right, yeah. Yeah, so the top 10 um, is approaching the end of its second year. And boy, has it been excellent. It has been, and we're getting some great submissions as of late. Another great top 10 this week, as you said. Definitely check that out. Check out the playlist, just let it run. Get on the get on the uh, top ten playlist and let it run. You won't be disappointed. That's uh, a couple of hours, Andrew. That's the funny thing is, if somebody really wanted to, yeah, you know, just watch great plays, uh, they could watch over two hours of great plays just by watching the top ten playlist. Oh, for sure, just Absolutely. letting it roll. That's how much footage is there. And we're getting some great suggestions as well from people of games they uh, want to see us play. We're asking for some more NBA Live '99 PC. Uh, highlights with the retro rosters we did the 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 champs rosters that loots made back in the day we've been playing some games with old mods which has been an absolute blast Uh, i mean these games are fun to revisit vanilla as i've said before derek but adding it just adds something a little extra when you get these old roster mods and play with them as well right i also think that the NLSC content, the, the the content that's going up on the YouTube and whatnot and what we're sharing on Twitter is also kind of unique in this space because it's not just Andrew playing by himself all the time or me playing by myself, you know, us playing against the computer. And we're not always playing the newest game and whatnot. What we're, we're doing is we're often connecting together online on these classic titles like NBA Hang Time, like NBA Live 2000, like NBA Live 96, NBA 2K13, and whatnot. And the you get to see us having a shared experience. You get to see us overcome adversity. You get us you get to see us, you know, putting together great plays. And other content too that, you know, I put up is like me and Stildo playing against each other 
on NBA 2K19 or me and Juicy Shack Meat teaming up and playing in early NBA Live, uh, in early 2000s NBA Live. So I think that the content is very unique. Um, I find it to be very high quality and we love to get people on that YouTube so it can be a shared experience with them as well. No, I, I totally agree, and, and that is obviously our our goal with our content. All of the, all of the content we create, whether it be mods, articles, videos, the podcast, we are for basketball gamers, by basketball gamers, as I've said before, and uh, that's always our intention, to deliver this great content and, and have fun doing so. That That is a key ingredient to enjoy what you're doing and not just chasing algorithms and whatnot, which we will be getting into uh, shortly. But it always... Warms my heart, Derek, when I see some very nice comments that we've received that really enjoy what we're doing with the games and saying, hey, I enjoy watching you play the games because you make these games look good and this is good action. Because as you know, when we've gone through a few previous seasons, seeing some of that early footage and people playing it at gaming conventions and whatnot, sometimes really good games don't look very good in the wrong hands. Yeah, so um, Nate... NBA Live 01 legend, Nate, uh, made a comment on my NBA 2K23, my team domination video on one of them. I've uploaded many to the NLC YouTube, but his comment was um, the only time where I really want to play this game is when I watch your videos. And I love that comment. Um, I really appreciate him for making that comment and whatnot. And it, it keeps me motivated to keep creating similar content Definitely. and whatnot and that's what we want to do we want to do have high quality gameplay videos and we want you to you know kind of get lost in them and in enjoy that action um a lot of the videos that you know try to show off games during preview season and whatnot and a lot of the people and we'll get to this later as well but a lot of the people that are playing these games like basically the controller is not in the right hand it's just somebody that um, either works for a review company and maybe doesn't even know that much about basketball video games, or maybe he's dabbled with them in t for in, you know time to time, but he's never really gone in depth. And maybe he doesn't even know that much about the sport. And you can kind of see that when they get their hands on the controllers and they're playing and they're taking shots that the players that they're using in real life would never take. Um, they're making really stupid turnovers. They're just not playing very well. Um, or it's somebody that, you know, is promoted and the company's trying to you know push out in front of people and for some reason who knows why and they're just not very good at the games and we've seen that many times before um but not all preview footage is bad there have been some people out there that have showed off the gameplay very nice so we're not saying everybody but you guys know what videos we're talking about you know what we're talking about you can tell you know if you if you're, right you can tell yeah. if you're a basketball game you can definitely tell who's uh who's good on the sticks and who knows uh, who knows the sport and, and whatnot. But you, you talked about Live 09. That is a game we connected on this week, and uh, we've been able to tee up some more time to uh, connect uh, recently, which has been great. Love to do that a bit more moving forward. Um, but Live 09, PS2, you know, that's a game that I've criticized a lot over the years. It is It was definitely an afterthought by that point, that version of the game. We didn't even get it on PC. So that, that was, and that was obviously a... Uh, uh, a controversy back in the day that we, we not only were we not getting a port of the 360 PS3 version, but even the PS2 port that we were getting, that was taken away as well. And there's a lot of roughness to it, but I have to say, Derek, I really enjoyed that session. I, I was uh, When you put it on, I'm like, okay, this is going to be interesting, because uh, you, you didn't tell me which game we were going to play, so I've got an idea for a game that we haven't connected on before together. So I said, okay, you know, I'm always game for that, as you know, and then 09 comes up, I'm like, okay, yep, let's see how this goes. And despite the roughness, that was a very fun session really makes a difference as a shared experience right andrew mm, i does. mean when when you played it back in the day um when it first was released and everything you were playing that game by yourself and you're playing it against the computer and you you know if there's something happened that frustrated with you you didn't you know that frustrated you you wouldn't have somebody to vent to right in that moment right exactly you didn't have yeah. so you wouldn't have somebody to um enjoy like a give and go alley-oop play like we did so many you're relying on the AI. Position. You're just relying on the computer yeah. to play a good game of basketball, both your teammates and the CPU giving you a good, stimulating challenge and entertaining gameplay. And if it doesn't, and as you say, you've got no one else to bounce off of and, and comment and joke with, yeah, it, it's uh, that really affects the experience. Right. And it's the same thing with a game like NBA Playgrounds, right? So my enjoyment with that game didn't come from a solo experience at all. It didn't come from a one-player experience. My brother and I, Nick... Him and I beat both 
NBA playgrounds and NBA um, 2K playgrounds too. Co-op. We 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 went through both campaigns. So I, I think I, on one of the games it was on NBA playgrounds. Uh, NBA 2K Playgrounds 2, it was the season mode. And then NBA Playgrounds, it was a similar, like, it was like a road trip. The campaign mode, type yeah. Mode. Like yeah. on the original, yeah, the campaign mode, um, where you travel around and play at different courts and different cities and different situations, and you have different types of challenges where you only use big men, etc. So, like, um, we beat both of those games co-op. You, your experience with Playgrounds was solo. It was a one-player experience and naturally my experience with that game is going to be better because i was able to share that experience with somebody else and if you ever have played a two-on-two game co-op with anybody whether it be nba jam college slam nba playgrounds uh etc like you know that the co-op experience is always going to be that much more fun than a single player with the possible exception of uh, hoops for nes that was that was a bit tough Still, can you imagine trying to play that solo? Yeah. At least we were able to, like, <laughs> yeah. can you imagine trying to play that two-on-two experience with a computer teammate? I think it's oh, still, yeah. I think it still would have been worse. And then Much you wouldn't worse. have been able to vent to me about losing to a couple of kids. Exactly. Um, Shameful. But NBA Live 09 for PS2 isn't an exact carbon copy of NBA Live 08. In fact, there were some enhancements, including a, a mode called Be a Pro. And I want to get into that in a minute. But before I get into like all the features in the game and how truly deep this game is, I can't even believe how many how deep this game is from a mode um, perspective and customization perspective. Um, I want to talk about the gameplay. So I think the biggest problem with that game is they went away from the smooth movement and smooth change of direction and overall control that you had in NBA Live 08 and tried something different with the controls and just moving your player left and right you, it's like your player is automatically made to go wide like you can't mm. make sharp turns no with your players anymore like you would be able to like as a real basketball player as a real athlete it's like it makes the movement very clunky it's very so, animation heavy, yeah. I noticed that. It's super animation heavy. It's way more animation heavy than NBA Live 08. And I know that because my brother and I started a legend season on NBA Live 08. And we enjoyed the gameplay more because the player movement was less animation heavy and less clunky. Um, the other big problem that I had with NBA Live 08's gameplay is the same problem that I had with NBA Live 05. And it was frustrating both of us is the players just stopping to receive every single pass. That's a very old school problem, and, that one. Yeah, that, that stopping on the fast break to go into that catch animation. And there were so many... We, we had some really nice plays, as people can see in the video, but there, there would have been even more if it had flowed just a little bit better. Yeah. I mean, we would have a situation where we would try to push the ball and um, you know, get like a two-on-one or and whatnot, and we would we'd push the ball up the floor and instead of having that two on one or even a two on zero, our player would stop to catch the ball. And by the time we were able to move forward or make an extra pass, the defense was already back. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just, just interrupts the flow completely. It robbed us of what would have been a couple of really nice plays. As you say, just those cuts to the hoop. Uh, sometimes you can get past it if you go for the lob like 2005, but yeah, that, that was definitely regression from 08 there. Right. And then otherwise, I mean, I think the shooting is sound. I think the shooting is fun. I think it's very similar to NBA Live 08 as far as like timing and whatnot, you know, taking sideways or fadeaways or just straight up shooting. I think it feels pretty good. Um, the dribbling is not as good as NBA Live 08. It's not as tight. It's still it's over animated and it's clunky. Um, so putting the ball on the floor isn't quite as fun. Um Right stick triple threat, though, as far as, you know, when you, you, you haven't put the ball on the floor, works basically the same as, like, NBA Live 08. Uh, there's some nice animations in the paint, like you saw Bill Walton's hook on that highlight video. Um, some different shot animations for different players, like Moses Malone and Bill Walton, um, have, like, a big man shot. So it looks different than when you're shooting with a guard. Um, same with free throws. There's different free throw animations in the game and whatnot. And obviously they're not using the T meter anymore. So now it's just going by timing and everything. Um, there are some good gameplay aspects and it was, 
it has enough good gameplay aspects where you and I were actually able to enjoy that session. And it even motivated me to upload that gameplay video to the YouTube. In, indeed. But of course, what really got me is on top of all of that, of course, is how many dunks were near rim stuffs? I don't understand what they were thinking with that because I don't think that's an NBA Live 08. It's not. No. Uh, I, you know, I blew by my guy with Dominique Wilkins and I went to do a monster two handed jam and he like basically gets stuffed by the rim, but the ball still bounces in. And I want to say that was, I know this sounds crazy, but I don't want to say that was like half of the dunks that. Oh, it that felt game. like it. Yeah. Yeah. That we played. It was like, there were probably 50% of the dunks weren't just clean flushes. It was like the player getting blocked by the rim and then the ball bouncing in. I don't know if they thought <laughs> yeah. that was realistic, but somebody programmed that. Yeah. So it's it's a very strange programming idea. It'd be interesting to see whether the sliders affect that of, of dunk success, whether it's a, it kind of comes down to the slider and, and something some weird happened there with the default settings or or whatnot. We were playing on the simulation settings, which defaults the sliders to a more supposedly more sim oriented, although it still feel, feels very arcade to, to my mind. But you mentioned be a pro. Uh, the 360 PS3 version of that was a single game uh, mode, basically to prepare you for online team play. The original online team play mode, which was NBA teams, everybody controls a single player, kind of like your modern online team play modes, of course, but NBA oriented, which uh, which I think there's a reason that that went away from that, that people wanted to play with their own avatar. But with Be A Pro on PS2, that was basically a single season career mode. It's ma- amazing. No cutscenes, no my career stuff. Basically, there's two options no for VC. Be A Pro. Be a live 09 for ps2 right no vc um there is play now so what it is is it's a player lock mode um where you so let's say you choose the los angeles lakers and you just want to lock on kobe so you'll select kobe on the um after you select your team and you will play in a, on a player lock camera view which i'm sure everybody's familiar with that's listening to this podcast it's kind of like an overhead um zoomed in view that's kind of like following you throughout the action that's basically what it is um and so you have that option in play now but then you also have a season option so it's basically a player lock season and you can use a existing nba player or you can use a created player and it's just so cool how this works. So the create a player thing isn't super deep. I think you have five base head shapes to choose from. And then you have like 14 or 15 different hairstyles and you can like tilt the eyes and change their size and the, the skull shape and everything. Some um, features. It's, it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty basic, but it works, right? I mean, it's a PS2 graphics. You could get a player to look basically kind of the way you want or like you, Etc. But the cool thing is, is you have like your base ratings, which I think they give you 50 points to use when you first create your player. And then when you're playing through the mode, you get challenges. So there was one that was like, you know, get at least one block this game. And then if you get that block, you've completed that challenge and you have more points you that you can use for your player. And the other cool thing is that it's not just player based challenges. You also have team based challenges. So it will say, you know, for a team, like beat this team by this many points or get this many team rebounds, et cetera. So you're pulling during these games for both your individual player goal, but also to help your team with a team goal. So what happens is, is you play your full games and you get boost points for your attributes and you can assign those to your player throughout the season and he gets better um you can be more productive on the floor um it has all the traditional stuff that you would get with um you know a season mode it's basically just like a season mode with player lock you know you have your espn stat central your player staff all your stuff is being tracked all of that stuff and i just find that mode awesome and i think that's what a lot of people would kind of like in um like nba 2k right like sure. the newest 2k is, NBA is like my career. A, yeah. right right a my career experience where you don't have all of the cut scenes and all the you know kind of the f- ridiculous drama and everything that comes with that and sometimes time wasting drama so be a pro excellent i also want to point out that it has full nba all-star weekend 
So like it has, you know, the all-star game, the three point shootout, the slam dunk contest, the rookie challenge, all of that is in this game. So like I said earlier, before I move, keep going with the depth. Sure. The gameplay is rough at times. And I think it's a downgrade from what it was in NBA live 08, but I don't think this game overall was like a complete afterthought for no, EA no. sports because the depth and the things that they've added, they added stuff too, like be a pro, but the depth in this game, Andrew was, there's a ton, there's a ton of stuff to do. Oh yeah. Afterthought is perhaps a problematic word in that respect. I mean, it was definitely not the focus. It was not the, uh, the, the main version of the game, the flagship version of NBA Live 09. But like a lot of last-gen versions, they did try to squeeze something extra in there for people who hadn't upgraded yet, people still sticking with it, or people like us who are collecting on multiple platforms, for example. Something a little extra for people still on PS2 at that time as it uh, entered its swan song. And, and yeah, that is impressive that they did that. Uh, un unfortunately, I think a lot of the mechanics at that, at that time were very dated, obviously, and some of them broken. And there were some, some just piling up on legacy issues, the sim engine and the stats engine in Dynasty, for example. So there were, there were issues that just weren't going to be fixed at that time for the non-priority version. Well, 100%. And we, we, we experienced a lot of those gameplay issues and legacy issues in that one game that we played, yeah. which was only six-minute quarters. Um, but, like, listen to this. So this game had the Legends pool still, which was 42 Legends. It had 24 FIBA teams, which um, I'm going to get into the FIBA championships mode in a second, which is absolutely outstanding as well. Uh, but it also had the all-decade teams still with the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And it had Team Adidas, um, which is which made up of like all Adidas athletes. It's guys like Duncan, KG, T-Mac, Arenas, Billups, Dwight Howard, Josh Smith, Anton Jameson, Barbosa, Paige Stoyakovic, and then a couple more. And they play in this really cool customized Adidas arena with an Adidas floor. And I was playing a little bit of that game, and it was a lot of fun. And it was really cool to see the action in that arena. But the FIBA championship mode is actually pretty cool. So there's 24 FIBA teams in the game, and there's obviously the preliminary rounds, so they make you play through that, which I believe is six games. And then you get into the 16-team tournament, so the teams that qualified for the FIBA championships. And, you know, you play you know, through those games and you try to win. But if you lose, you're allowed to, you'll get a prompt that says your team has been eliminated. Do you want to use a team that's still alive in the tournament? So say you lose early in the first round or the second round of the FIBA championships, you can, you know, use a team that's existing and try to bring them to the promised land and win the title. Um, and this mode is full with stat tracking, um, FIBA presentation, and everything so like i think that that's a great touch for the ps2 version i think that's a great thing for people who love fiba and they didn't have to put that into the ps2 version but they did and i think it works well yeah they, they've got the fiba teams in for 08 when they introduced them the previous year and as i've mentioned before when you go into the files on the pc version of 08 you can see that there are some uh leftover data from what were going to be historical teams so we're going to put some championship and historical teams in 08 from the looks of things and that fell through which maybe led to the fever getting the fever as the uh, backup for that uh, content got that on both uh, versions of 08 then to bring it into 09 as you said but going to the trouble of adding those teams and having those options in uh, in the, the fever world championship mode yeah now they were definitely trying to give us something on on ps2 um but yeah, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of it, a lot of the rest of the game, the mechanics and whatnot, were uh, had aged by that point. But uh, a lot of depth, even going into the play now screen, Derek. Uh, did you notice that you can actually uh, cycle through uh, different types of teams, the All Star teams, the FIBA teams, and the NBA teams? That, that's something we have now in 2K on the play now screen that you can sort teams by those categories, and that's a very that's a very small thing. But that wasn't in 08 either, so it's just little things like yeah. that, that they were still yeah. doing. Yeah. And that was and that was a new implementation implementation um, over the last few years for um, NBA 2K, and I think it's they implemented that option when they added the all time teams. Yes, because then there were just so many different teams in the game and so many different options. They wanted people to have a quick way to select, um, you know, what types of teams that they want to use. Um, I also want to point out too, 
So just as this is just a base selection of modes for this game. It's season, dynasty mode, playoffs, FIBA World Championships, be a pro, NBA All-Star Weekend, Freestyle Challenge, one-on-one practice mode. Um, and that's a lot of depth. And I, I want to remind people that NBA Live 09 for Xbox 360 and PS3, you could only use one team in their dynasty mode. That was it. You just had like that one team you could use. But the thing that my brothers and I love, and a lot of people loved that, you know, like to play locally or knew somebody they could play with locally and whatnot, you can control all 30 teams in a season mode on NBA Live 09 for PS2. So you can do fantasy drafts, use the regular NBA teams and everything. So um, you do have more depth in the PS2 version than you do in like the 360 version. I also want to point out, I think one of the coolest things, Andrew, about NBA Live 09 is the main menu. The main menu on that game just kicks butt. It is real highlights and it takes up the whole screen behind the menu. Um, it's It looks like it's random when like whatever highlights they show. But it's like one time I booted it up and it was like, a string of a bunch of highlights of Paul Pierce. So it was just like Paul Pierce focused highlights. The next time I booted it up, it was Kobe. The next time I booted it up, it was Dwight Howard, et cetera. And these are real life highlights of these players. And there's a ton of them that show during, you know, in the background during, you know, you're in, when you're in the main menus and in the menus and whatnot. And I thought that was a really cool touch. And I actually wish more games did that. That's something from the presentation of old games that I really miss. You know how much I love the the golden presentation of NBA Live 96, the the uber 90s presentation of NBA Live 97 PC. Just that that real character to the menus. And and it is ultimately just the menus. It is just aesthetic. But all that stuff used to get us hyped up to play. Oh, 100%. Um, There was a thing with NBA 2K9 um, that when you went into a game after you chose your teams, uh, it says, you know, you know, Kobe Bryant and the Los Angeles Lakers or Paul Gasol and the Los Angeles Lakers. Mm. And it shows um, a few highlights of, you know, Kobe or Pa, real highlights. And then it says versus, you know, KG or Kevin Garnett and the Boston Celtics. And then it shows highlights of KG with the Celtics. And it's like real highlights and it looks amazing. And it just definitely gets you pumped up to use those players on the floor. The last thing I want to say about depth is it has all of your, you know, for NBA live 09, it has create a player, edit player, reorder roster, trade players, sign release players, reset rosters, player hotspots, player DNA. So for roster customization, you also have a lot to work with. You can edit players ratings in that game and edit their gear. Right. And not all basketball games, uh, you know, over the last 20 years have had that ability to be able to go and do that. In fact, think about it. There's the the lives that were on the um, Xbox one PS4 generation, the newer lives. Um, they didn't have that up until NBA Live 19 decided to allow you to mess with with some stuff. Right. So like. I think that it's impressive that they still had all of that customization and all of that ability that was given to users for, you know, roster management for Live 09 for PS2. And to that point, my my final comment, I guess, on 09 is that it's a shame it didn't come to PC. As as rough as it is, it would have been better than having no game at all. It might have have, uh, proven that we still wanted a a Live on PC. It might have transitioned into maybe getting a Live 10 port from uh, 360 PS3. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we still would have gone downhill with NBA Elite 11, obviously, and all the roughness that came after that. But yeah, it's just a shame that they had one last release on that generation and they didn't port it to PC. Uh, a damn shame. So I visited the NLSC NBA Live 09 not coming to PC forum thread. And um, yeah, there were a lot of unhappy people in that thread. Um, people stating that they were done with EA um they'll never play another nba live again um i think it was the live king who was in there and was basically like you guys knew this was you you know you guys should have expected that we weren't going to get nba live 09 um on pc and you know that they were going to be focusing on the 360 version and everything and he was right but um yeah there's a there was a lot of upset people in that thread and who can blame them because for them 
for a lot of the people in that thread and on the NLSC community, uh, they knew NBA Live is the premier basketball PC title, right? All the way back since, you know, NBA, the mid 90s, since NBA Live 95, uh, NBA Live was a staple. From Live 95 all the way up to NBA Live 08, even though they skipped, obviously, NBA Live 2002. But, um, yeah, it is too bad that they didn't continue releasing on PC. Before we go on, a reminder that the NLSC podcast comes out every week on the NLSC, mb-live.com, as well as our YouTube channel. We're also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast apps. If you're listening on any of those apps, we'd greatly appreciate a review. To keep up with the show and everything we're doing with basketball gaming in general, connect with us on social media. On Twitter and Facebook, we are the NLSC. We also have an Instagram, NLSC Basketball, and on YouTube, we're youtube.com slash NBA Live Series Center. Once again, visit us at nba-live.com, where in addition to the podcast, you'll also find all of our original content, as well as our forum and modding community. But no, NBA Live 09 PS2 is, is a game that I wouldn't mind revisiting again. Have another go at it at some point. And uh, yeah, I, I'm always open to uh, revisiting these games and seeing if my mind has changed. To that point, Derek, I actually played NBA 2K Playgrounds 2 over the past couple of days. Yeah, I'm glad to see that you actually went back and, you know, beat that game. I know that you haven't had as much fun with it as me because you've been playing, you know, it solo. And there is no, in my opinion, two on two experience that is better solo and whatnot. But um, I'm glad that you went through and collected the players that you wanted and, you know, and got through it. Yeah, finishing a season with the Bulls. I hadn't played through a season in the few years that had come out. I had put it aside. But, you know, what? I've been talking about it on the podcast and in articles, Derek, the idea of going back to games with fresher eyes and giving them a second chance and, and seeing what uh, whether it actually whether my mind has changed or whether I, if I can actually have fun with it. And, yeah, I, I actually did. And playing solo, which, which, again, is surprising for that game because I think it does play so much better as a uh, co-op or competitive experience against a, another user. But I did have fun. Uh, I still have a lot of players to unlock. This is on PC. I did actually pay for the unlock all on PS4. My cousin was coming down to visit, so I wanted to play with those players. And uh, yeah, at the time I didn't have the PC version. I don't think I picked it up on Steam. Hadn't double dipped yet. So I just unlocked all there. This time I'm trying to actually unlock all the players, seeing how patient I can be about unlocking some of my favorites. Uh, the long way, uh, the ho hovering over the unlock all roster option, thinking, do I want to pay it? No, I don't really want to pay the many extra for this. But uh, giving it a go, seeing who I can unlock. And, and look, a lot of my previous criticisms of the game still stand. It, it is still uh, slower paced compared to NBA Jam games. I think the, the balance isn't quite there. The, the lottery pick system is interesting, but it's not as exciting as on fire, as being on fire in NBA Jam. But I, I had fun, and it, and it did feel pretty good on the sticks. It, and 2K Playgrounds 2, to its credit, did improve on it in its feel on the original, I believe. And, and yeah, I actually had a good time with it. It's, it's a game that I might dust off from time to time. So when my brother and I beat the season mode on that game, um, it was with me on Drexler. We were using the Rockets, so it's the Rockets Drexler, and him on Pippin. That's how we won that mode for the first time. And we were a little frustrated because um, during that time, Pippin was saying all of that ridiculous stuff about MJ and kind of lying yes. and whatnot in real life. And it's like, why did we have to win this with Pippin? Why couldn't it be, you know, Drexler and somebody that we were fond of at the time? So, um, yeah, I think uh, Playgrounds 2 was tighter gameplay-wise, I think, than the original playgrounds however i think that it was a mistake to just have a season mode in there as opposed to like the full campaign that was in the original my brother and i actually ended up having a lot more fun playing through the campaign on playgrounds than we did on the sea the, the season on playgrounds too and the reason is is because all the different challenges uh the fact that you could use players from different teams and pair them together um you know you'd have challenges where you had to you know use two centers to be able to get blocks or uh etc and you you played in all of these different interesting locations and everything whether it be on the beach or um at night or something like that so like i think that i like the gameplay possibly a little bit better on playgrounds too but i like the campaign far better the campaign option far better on um the original 
Well, it's very repetitive. And you've got the little challenges to level up players and get extra boosts to their ratings, which are permanent, obviously, and unlocking the players and then leveling them up. But to that point, I feel it's a bit too much. And it wouldn't be so bad if it was deeper, as you say, a deeper campaign mode. Like a Road Trip on Fire Edition, it's very hard to come back to an arcade game after playing Road Trip and seeing how deep that experience is and how much it can change up the the campaign scenarios in arcade basketball games. And, and even, look, going back to the original NBA Jam games, sometimes you could only play them for so long because there was only so much to do. Compared to the uh, compared to Sim games with their full season mode and All-Star Weekend and many of the things we just talked about with Live 09, in fact... And, yeah, it's it's just a bit too repetitive. There's a review on Steam where somebody's talking about all the people whining and crying about having to unlock players. But I think it's, it's a very misguided comment, a very immature comment, obviously. But one of the advantages of NBA Jam was having all of those players on their teams readily available. Yes, you have that depth of upgrading players and unlocking them and getting pulling them in packs, random, randomly pulling them in packs in Playgrounds 2 and original Playgrounds, of course. But it feels very artificial, that depth, uh, more like busy work, very repetitive, as I said. So that's what I don't like about it. It is fun on the sticks, but it's definitely got some drawbacks there. How many people were actually complaining about having to unlock players on NBA Playgrounds? Because I don't remember seeing that much of it. And also, I don't think that game was that popular. Um, I saw hardly any videos go up on YouTube, gameplay-wise, for that game. It was barely talked about on operation sports uh it was barely talked about on the nlsc forum hardly at all uh so um i'm not sure how many people were even playing that game i mean i know that was a complaint that about about unlocking players and certainly a complaint that i had that it was a bit too much and when you started adding more and more players in the second game then it became ridiculous and of course they they 2 k'd it if you will with uh, even more microtransactions and the the golden bucks on top of the baller bucks Sabre made a pretty good game there, but as soon as they uh, came under the 2K umbrella, they started... It, I mean, it got MJ in the game, it got Kobe and Kareem in the game, that was awesome, but it also brought the other problems that we've had for years in 2K. I can agree with that, definitely. I, I like the term 2 k it yeah. because we all know what that means at this point in relation to, like... At this point, in relation to, like, microtransactions, unlocking things, putting things behind paywalls, etc. But no, it was nice to dust it off and have some fun with it. As I said, I will be playing it again. Uh, you've also been playing some 2K19 recently, game released, released around the same time, of course, uh, with your new fantasy draft roster. I have. Uh, my brother and I are now 10 games into our My League, uh, where we did an all-time fantasy draft. Uh, we're still working on the roster. Uh, we're trying to get a portrait in for every single player. We've added over 100 now. Um, to players existing in the roster and we're still t- touching up attributes badges signatures etc but i think once that final product is done it's going to be great to release that you know for free obviously over on the nlsc and let other people enjoy that because i, I do think that there's still a small player base for nba 2k19 um but i did upload a video to the nlsc youtube a gameplay video if people want to check that out see how that roster is going and how the game plays with it um where my brother and I on our team for the Magic, we have Tracy McGrady. I'm locked on Shaq all season. So we have Tracy McGrady, Shaq, Barkley, who somehow fell to the third round. We were like, how can you not take Charles Barkley in the third round of this draft? Um, we have Paige Stoyakovich, uh, Steve Francis, uh, Theo Ratliff, uh, Ralph Sampson, Josh Smith, Tim Thomas, and um, Reggie Theus, and Ricky Davis. That's basically the players that are in the rotation right now so it's a fun team that you know really gets out and runs we have lob threats uh we have a bunch of versatile players who not only can take it to the hoop but they can shoot threes guys like ricky davis like tim thomas and whatnot um alan houston's excellent to use and whatnot and we're just having a blast with it but that gameplay video we we had a really tough team that we were playing against and we actually went down 20 in that game and had to come back but you know we were against wilt chamberlain and rick barry and alex english drazen petrovich and whatnot and they had everything that they needed in order to give us a really hard time um so we have lost one game this season and we're playing it on hall of fame we're nine and one but that is a lot of fun i also connected with Stildo33 from the NLSC community. He's been a guest on the podcast a couple times and whatnot. And we played our 
NBA 2K 19, 94, and 95, my league using those amazing, amazing retro season rosters. And we, we played four games over the week, over the last week. So yeah, we, we played Sonics versus Cavs. I won that game. Magic versus Heat. He won that game pretty handily against me. Uh, Sonics versus Hawks. Uh, he ended up making a comeback in that game, but I ended up winning that game by five and then magic versus Suns. And if anybody knows that 94, 95 Suns team, they are, they were super fun to watch in real life. They were really good on paper and they just had a lot of talent on that team. It's, you know, Charles Barkley, Dan Marley, um, you know, Kevin Johnson, Danny Manning and, and whatnot, Danny Ainge. And I ended up winning that game and giving him his fifth loss of the season. That was definitely the most fun game that we had out of the four, but he he's 18 and five on the season. I'm 21 and zero with the supersonics and it's just super fun to connect with him. He's good at the game and we're just having a blast. I love seeing those highlights. I love getting the, the updates on it. I know how much fun you're having the 95 season as I said, it's kind of a weird one as a Bulls fan back in the day. You know, it's not the best one for the Bulls. Of course, obviously, the MJ's comeback is, is huge. But that's a, it's a very memorable time in the NBA, regardless. 90s, the golden era of the NBA. I still uh, still still contend that. And, and yeah, that 95 season, a lot of interesting storylines happening. And, of course, that big showdown in the in the playoffs. And it will be, uh, be interesting to see how your 95 season goes down the rest of the way. What was your reaction as a hardcore Bulls and MJ fan to him announcing his return? I mean, it's just, a, you know, that, that was huge. People, the announcement, I'm back. It was, it was such a, just a, such a big thing for all, for bas- all basketball fans. But yeah, it's like, oh, this is going to be something, some new highlights to enjoy, some new, new you know, promise that the Bulls can get back on top and, uh, and win again. Did you think that they were going to win that year? Uh, ninety five. I, I don't think I. Uh, I don't think I did. Uh, but not ninety six. I. Uh, yeah. When they start, started racking up those wins, you know, all the way to seventy two and ten, and then finishing it off with the uh, with the fourth championship. Yeah, that was uh, very special. That that just basically solidified my my basketball fandom that year. And immediate redemption for MJ in the playoffs against the Orlando Magic in the ninety six playoffs where they swept him. So um, that must have felt good for him after you know in 1995 them dropping that series and um and whatnot oh oh definitely and that's a it's a great series i, I have it on vhs and i've watched those games uh, several times and it, it's funny to go back and see uh see Shaq talking before the series oh dennis rodman you know he's not gonna get in my head by the end of the series rodman was in his head yeah i mean i think rodman got in most players heads um <laughs> frank, frank i'd Burkowski, say guys very famously in the yeah I, yeah frank Burkowski. that's that's a classic example and whatnot but there were certain people that uh certain players that i think were immune to it or too tough for him to break them down and guys like anthony mason charles oakley like i don't think that rodman really could get in those guys heads but um i think players that weren't as strong mentally i think rodman could kind of break them oh definitely and speaking of that era and uh and retro uh, rosters and whatnot made a, made a, quite a bit of progress on my 2k10 missing legends roster last night uh, i was working on that uh, actually throughout the afternoon uh, it's been really fun to get back into that and really giving me a taste of doing more roster work what i'd like to do derek with that because i'm going to put that out there it's, it's final 2010 season rosters the final official update with missing legends added and i want to do the same for some other games start at small 2k11 adding the missing plays to the Jordan Challenge rosters to the final official roster, putting it out there. Putting it out there as also a, a roster if people want to take that and then build upon that with those assets and make something else, that they can do that as well. For other retro modders, uh, I'd just like to do that. Or even for our own uh, retro gaming sessions over Parsec, Derek, I'd love to have that on hand, just those resources and put them out there for the community. Uh, just, just some small things as I build up to maybe a, a bigger project this year. And I've got a couple other ones that are like the ultimate jordan rosters for live 2005 to 08 that's still kind of there on the in the workshop so to speak love to get back into that uh, for march modernist but just starting out small and adding these this missing content to these rosters and restoring the classic teams in live 08 pc because we have the assets on hand to to do that and, and put that in the official rosters and it's not a maybe not a huge comprehensive roster retro roster project but it's it's just adding something that's missing from the game kind of a throwback to the earlier days of modding just like to put that out there for the community. The smaller projects are oftentimes a lot less stressful and the completion of them is just a lot more attainable. Mm. And there's a lot of reward in that, right? 
not only for yourself, but the fact that you were able to release something and, you know, the community oh, oh, for could sure. latch yeah. onto it and get a better experience. I, I want to use an example of a, and this doesn't need mods. Like this, it doesn't need to be on PC. It doesn't need to be like a modding project. This can is something that anybody can do on console as long as the team, the, the video game has all time teams. Just doing a minimalist project where you, you know, do an all time teams roster with no duplicates. That right there is a project that a lot of people would like. So instead of playing, you know, Lakers versus Orlando Magic with the all time teams and it's Shaq versus Shaq you now have um, no duplicates. And if you want to call it this, like a more realistic, um, immersive experience. Um, because I personally never liked that. I never liked going like Shaq versus Shaq or, you know, this the, the same player versus the same player. So even on console, you don't have to be on PC to be a modder. You can modify things on console, just like MJ Wizards is, right? For NBA 2K23 with his My NBA Era projects, you know, perfecting those and creating the missing players and everything. Um, even just something like all time teams with no duplicates is a great roster project that doesn't add a lot of stress to you. Um, and it's something that the community can, you know, enjoy. And of course, if you are making it available for other people to use or even for your own projects, it's, uh, it's a stepping stone to other things, it's, it's, it's uh, assets in place. And I was actually going to ask you about that because I am thinking of removing one of the Shacks from the 90s uh, All-Stars in the 2K10 rosters because it, he is on the East and the West. And, and I, I also think that's uh, overkill as well. It's one thing to have like an MJ in the 90s and put an MJ in the 80s as well because they do have some duplicates there and it's kind of like an 80s version, a 90s version. Same. With I think that's different though. Yeah, well, no, absolutely. no, I think, I think all decade teams is a little bit different. When I think of like all-time teams, I think of it's something that somebody might want to bring into like a my league. Sure, or like a sure. my NBA or like start a season with all decade teams is a little different. And plus that's an easy fix, right? If you want to take Jordan off of one of those teams, you can just take him off one of the teams and, you know, have an eighties versus nineties experience with only one MJ. That's a quick thing. But I think it's a little different when you're dealing with the all decade teams. With oh, that. oh, for sure. I, I still thought about overriding Shaq with Matumbo, for example, because Shaq's already in the East and Matumbo is missing. So I thought maybe get an extra player in there. So yeah, I was interested to, to uh, hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, you're talking about like East and West because he's on both decade teams, right? He's on two decade teams, yeah. And, and, two yeah. Shacks, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. I think that uh, I would not be using those teams seriously anyway, so it wouldn't affect me that much. Mm. Um, but I think that I like where you're going with it because, I mean, Shaq was with Orlando for – how many years in the 90s? Four. Yeah. All-star every year. And, yeah, and he was an all-star every single year. And then he was with the Lakers for 96, 97, 97, 98, 98, 99, and so four years. So, yeah, it doesn't. He, he can fit on either the East or the West, but for the 90s, I would put him on the East. Yeah, I was thinking of leaving him the East one and then uh, possibly replacing him with Matumbo on the West just to have that uh, balance there and, and those different matchups and an extra player in there. I thought that would be more fun, but... Yeah, the big thing is going. I've been going through all the existing legends, as I said, and giving them proper ratings because some of them are just so many copy and paste ratings, and they're just missing their tendencies and everything and their hotspots. So yeah, th there was a lot of rush jobs on that roster. So on top of everything else, just fixing that stuff up and putting it out there, I think will be fun for people to use. Yeah, and I think NBA 2K10 is still a beloved game in the series, not just because Kobe's on the cover and everything. I just think it was always like a pretty popular release uh and whatnot and it was a hit i would say on the different forums like the nlsc and in operation sports and then you know it was a game that was reviewed very well and there's still gameplay videos that go up for it today so i think that nba 2k10 is a good um game to have projects on now i'm looking forward to finishing it and so that we can connect with it on parsec actually i think that'll be a lot of fun but I will keep everybody up to date on the progress of that. Stay tuned for it. It shouldn't be too much longer before that's out because I did get a lot of work done on it yesterday. As I said, I'm sure you'll be keeping the community up to date on your mods as well. We have March Modernist coming up in March, obviously. That will be a celebration of modding. And I'll have a I've already prepared a few releases. I'm looking forward to getting a bit more involved with that this year. More releases and being a part of March Modernist, Derek. Mods, of course, just one form of content in our community. And that kind of brings us, Derek, to uh, Influencers. Yeah, so I guess I'll start this off by using an example, and I did this on purpose. I ran a poll today 
asking people, um, you know, weight wise, what do they think is more important? The quality of a video or who you know and who will promote that video? And I did like a 100% quality scale, uh, a scale of 100% quality and 0% having to do with, you know, who you know and who will promote you. Um, 80% quality, 20% who you know, 50 50 and 20% quality and 80% who you know. And then I offered the option to also reply if they had a differing answer or wanted to, you know, expand uh, on an answer and whatnot. So I want to give an example of just using that tweet, that poll and the amount of responses I got. I want to give an example of why um, it is so important to have an influencer or a company, um, somebody with a big follower account, subscriber account, et cetera, you know, retweeting or promoting your stuff. So for that poll, the poll received 19 votes. I had the poll up for eight hours. The poll received 19 votes and 288 impressions in that eight hour span. Um, this is with no promotion. This is you retweeting it from the NLSC channel. And that's, that's the, that was the promotion. That was basically it. And you retweeted it probably with only two hours left of the poll being out there and active. So if this poll had been shared by one influencer, even someone with around, I don't know, 5k followers, that impression count would be in the thousands and hundreds of votes would have been tallied. If the poll was shared by one influencer with 50K or more followers, and you and I know many accounts like, know of many accounts like that on Twitter, the poll would have gained tens of thousands of impressions and possibly have thousands of votes. But here is the kicker, Andrew. The message is the same, yet because it would be promoted by someone with an incredibly high follower count. Uh, the the tweet would ended up would have ended up getting a much bigger audience and would gain and you yourself, you know, the the owner of the account would gain more followers. And then in turn, future tweets will now be seen by more people, shared by more people, and overall more um, people will have interacted with the tweets in general. And I want to point out, before I throw this over to you, that the algorithm thing is kind of BS in a way. The people that say, well, you just have to hit the algorithm. Because I think the algorithm is also controlled to an extent. There have been numerous videos where I put the most popular hashtags up for like NBA 2K23 or something that was trending at the time. And I would send that tweet out and I would do it at the prime time of the day, Andrew. And I would get almost no interaction, oftentimes under a hundred impressions. But when I had one of these tweets retweeted, no comment, nothing, just retweeted by somebody who works for NBA 2K, all of a sudden, because this person has a decent follower account, not a super follower account, I think it was around they might have like 10K or something like that, 20K followers and whatnot. All of a sudden, my impression count like shot up to the thousands. I had over 100 likes on the, on the tweet all of a sudden and a ton of interaction. I didn't hit the algorithm even though I did everything right. And this constantly happens on the NLSC YouTube, on my tweets, on King J. Mace's tweets and all of that stuff. It took that person who worked for 2k and in other cases it would be like an influencer somebody who's maybe pushed by the company um somebody with a super high follower car account in general to retweet it but that's what it takes and that's what it took in order to get that tweet out there and for people that you know have low follower accounts oftentimes to get recognized so before like i move forward i wanted to get your thoughts on my poll example and then you know what i was talking about with the algorithm i love how you made the poll basically a, a self-demonstrating example of exactly what you're talking about there and looking at some of the results there and uh you know people saying the quality does matter which it absolutely does but you know you're absolutely right i've had a couple of tweets gain traction uh, when i shared the 
uh, the in case you missed it post about the rising cost of my career, uh, Dom Two K very coolly retweeted that and it re- he saw it and resonated with him and he shared it to his followers and that gained a bit of traction. It's one of the most popular tweets we've had on the NLSC account. Uh, on my right, po- and before he tweeted that, really quick, before he retweeted that, crickets. Yeah, a couple of the and that's our, not regu- your our regulars. Yeah, our regulars, you know, responding to it, which was cool, but it reached a right. wider audience. Uh, even though I had, as you said, you, as you said, used the hashtags and talked about a, a pertinent topic to the uh, basketball gaming community, it does come down to getting seen. On my personal account, uh, I made a comment la- last year about how uh, a particular Simpsons reference that's talking about uh, the old man, uh, old man yells at Cloud, uh, is actually uh, turned twenty years old that episode last year. So a lot of people who use that to dismiss the uh, opinions of old heads. Uh, "Quote unquote old heads." It's just funny that they're using an episode, a very old episode, to make fun of uh, of uh, people older than them. Uh, and they may not have even been around when that episode came out. But I forgot that uh, Al Jean, the uh, showrunner, producer, executive producer of The Simpsons, actually follows me on Twitter. Uh, followed me back at some point, uh, which was kind of cool. But he saw that, liked it, retweeted it, and all of a sudden that actually got a bit of traction with people. And yeah, he's obviously got a much bigger following than I do on my personal account or the NLSE account. So, yeah, that's what, that's what it comes down to, having your, your content promoted and shared by people with influence. And, of course, you know we appreciate everybody who interacts with our content and shares it now, beloved regulars, of course. But to get your, your content out there, it does take not just hitting the algorithm. That's nice when you do, but it also does take somebody with influence sharing it. But I'd love for somebody to come up with, you know, prime examples of somebody just hitting the algorithm and then getting an enormous amount of interaction and views, impressions and everything. Because I have to be honest with you, in any viral tweet, if in, in any viral video and everything, or at least in most that I've seen, it's usually because it was shared or the or that person was already somebody who was promoted by a company or was um or was like a major influencer in some capacity themselves and everything i um i just don't buy the algorithm bs a lot of time because i've been doing this long enough now as you know um you know as far as like with youtube videos um as far as like you know twitter content and everything and, and I think really what it comes down to most of the time is, you know, what high follower account is going to share your stuff. And I want to give an example of this. So King J Mace is doing some amazing things with the elite street league. I think you would agree with the ESL, with getting all of the community together and connecting on Parsec, um, playing five on five street ball. And I think you would agree, you know, King J Mace has just done some amazing things. Um, you know, with the communities, connecting with them online, um, playing uh, with a bunch of different people from the community and getting games together. He's great on the mic. Uh, He, you know, he hashtags appropriately a lot of the time. He puts NBA 2K23 on his videos on YouTube. So, you know, NBA 2K23 gameplay, et cetera. And no matter how good his content is, no matter how good, how much better it is than videos that are getting 300 times the amount of views and interactions he just can't break into the algorithm he does not get that many views on his channel and it's a damn shame he doesn't get as many interactions as he should he doesn't get as many people tuning into his streams as an as a result and i feel bad like i feel for him because i know he is having fun on the sticks and his goal is to have fun on the sticks and connect with the community but the more people that he would reach with his content the more people that he reaches, the more people are going to have a better experience with the game, right? Like he's going to be able to enhance more people's experiences and they can in turn, you know, have a better time. And that's the goal. We all want to have fun and everything and positively influ- influence as many people as possible. So I feel for guys like him because I see videos uh, that go up, which are either streams or, you know, gameplay videos where it's just ridiculous commentary it sounds silly um there um the gameplay is poor in comparison to what king j mace puts out um the community's not involved in those videos because the the guy's not connecting with them it's all about him 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 etc or her 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 um but it's a damn shame that there's so many videos out there that are getting 300 times the views that he's getting 
with much poorer quality content and not as good content for the community. And I think you would agree. I mean, we can definitely relate to that, can we not? When we've been pretty proud of a video and it hasn't uh, gotten quite the, the traction that we hoped. I I'm just looking at my personal account because I've uploaded a couple of things there. And the the algorithm can be random. Like When you're trying to hit it, that's when it seems to be, uh, it doesn't seem to work. But then I've uploaded things to that channel that have just got ridiculous amount of views for what they are. Again, I have 111 subscribers on that account. It's basically a personal account. I, I upload stuff there to share in the forum. Uh, any kind of proper content I do for the NLSC channel. But I've got that video up there. Um, it's, it's a compilation of Ronnie's uh, mishaps from the Celebrity Game a few years back. Um, it's got 73,857 views. That, and that is a lower content, 23 second, lower con a lower effort content than I've ever done for the NLSC. And it's, it hit the algorithm somehow. I've got a couple of my career videos on there. Uh, again, short videos, about 20 seconds, 15, 20 seconds, 24,000, 10,000 views. And it's weird that that's hit the algorithm, yet some of the some of the really good content that we've made for the NLSE channel hasn't. So it is frustrating that you feel like you're doing everything right. I'm just chucking it up there to it's share. It's almost it. like your brand. It's almost like our brand accounts being penalized somehow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, I, I mean, that's it's very strange. It, yeah, it's it's strange. And, and you do see some of these videos, like people have uploaded a short clip of a, a Simpsons clip or something from years ago that's just blown up in recent years as as it's randomly hit the algorithm. And you see they've just uploaded it randomly because oh, you know, I like to share it with somebody. I like this clip and. Funny, funny joke. I'll right, share but I think one. the algorithm, Andrew. But I think the algorithm is controlled. That's the point. It's sure. not just uh, I. It's not I just. <laughs> it's not you saying hashtag NBA two K twenty three. No, I'm going to give the, actually the Simpsons example. It's not just saying like hashtag Simpsons or hashtag this related to the Simpsons or wording related to the Simpsons. Simpsons, and then all of a sudden your tweet gets like because it's the same wording. Suddenly it gets to a hundred thousand people. Right, like. There is something strange with the algorithm that it's not just, oh, I hit it because we're all using that same hashtag, Andrew, right? So like my problem is, is, is like, like if you go to like the NLSC YouTube, okay? So this is a perfect example. I think you would agree that my, my NBA 2K23, my team domination videos, they're good quality. Like the gameplay is really good. Definitely, yeah. Right? Um, I could, I got like, under 200 views on the NLSC YouTube uploading those. If that exact same content, the exact same video was uploaded by somebody with, I don't know, somebody who was promoted, let's say it was promoted on the o Operation Sports, let's say um, I was a next maker, right? And I made that video and I was pushed and, the, and it was shared on these different sites by 2K and I was pushed you know, by reviewers are like, Hey, look at this video that this person uploaded. Maybe it was an IGN review or something like that. That same exact gameplay video with that quality would have reached hundreds of thousands of people probably. And it would have had a ton of interactions and everything. I tagged that video exactly the way I was supposed to, or those videos, the videos in general, you know, hashtag NBA 2K23. Um, I added to the key tags, you know, hashtag domin um, my team domination. Hashtag my, NBA 2K23, my team domination, all of that stuff. Um, you know, hashtag Michael Jordan. Because Michael Jordan's playing in the game, so we'll use a hashtag like that sometimes too. Sure, yeah. But, right? But it got under 200 views. So as a content creator, knowing that you're making good content, knowing that the gameplay is really strong and that it's in, you know, high definition and it's 60 FPS and the presentation is what people want to see and all of that stuff. And you put that out there and crickets luckily you and i love what we do right like we love basketball gaming to the point that we want to jump on this podcast every week and talk about hoops right yeah. we love basketball gaming to the point where we're going to connect on parsec anyway and play and if we upload a video and it only gets 100 views we still had fun with that gameplay um, experience and we're still glad that we uploaded right like you're still going to play NBA 2K14 while nobody's watching, have a blast, and then, you know, share your video for anybody who maybe happens to see it, and you'll be happy if you get one comment, right? So, like, we love basketball gaming to the point where we're just going to keep doing it anyway, but it does every now and then. It can get frustrating when you know you're putting out quality, but it's not reaching as many people as you would like it to reach because you know that it would enhance their experiences. 
Well, it is, and, it, and it's you can be proud of the content, and you, and you wish that it, more people saw it. But it, it is a situation where if you aren't being favoured by the algorithm or people who are uh, have that following to share it with to help uh, expand your following, or, or if, if you're not creating the kind of content that is in vogue, for example. I mean, look, my 2K14 retro series that we mentioned earlier, where I'm taking a couple of retro teams and playing a game and then putting all that retro presentation in, in post-production to make it look like a, an old school broadcast look that is not uh th- that content is not like a like a build video or a pack opening video for 2k it is not the the popular content du jour now the people who watch it have been very kind with their comments and you know i'm happy that it's uh, you know it's fun to do as you say and it's it's uh, reaching an audience that's that does appreciate it but it's not the popular thing and and these days if you're not making the if you're not imitating the current popular type of content then you you don't get pushed you don't get promoted and you, you look at tiktok people imitating dancers uh, there are people creating original content of their own on tiktok but a lot of it is following a trend and you and i we prefer to create what we want to create rather than jumping on a trend just for the sake we do of, what we love yeah just for the sake we of d- it but i will say this i, I want to bring back to the build video andrew great example but let's say you made a build video for NBA 2K23 or King J. Mace made a build video. Actually, I think he made a video similar and it got no traction. But let's say you made a, a, a build video for NBA 2K23 and you uploaded it to the NLSC YouTube and used all of the popular hashtags. Do you really think that that video is going to blow up? No, my not, not without, not without help. It's not. No, because there's, there's a lot no, of people. You, exactly, people. exactly, exactly. Not without help. That is, that's the point that I'm trying to make, not without help. And the other thing that, 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 that came to mind when we were talking about this topic last week, when we were planning to, to talk about it, is obviously the impact that the whole, that the whole influencer movement has had on uh, community interactions, on feedback, and of course, who gets to be promoted, who gets to work with the brands, who gets to have a logo in the games. And look, I don't want that. I, I don't want any of that stuff. But I go back to the earlier days of the community because I've obviously been around for a long time. I've been running the NLSC since 2001. So yes, going into twenty, going on 22 years of running the site, I had my NBA Live domain before that. And back in the day, working with EA Sports more closely or having that contact there and going to a couple of community events and being able to get interviews and having a, a contact there in the company, you know, it was very different working with the community managers back then that they were willing to work with any any popular fan sites of nba live for ea of course uh so us the nlsc formerly the nba live series center of course nba live.org and a couple of other sites like that other sites that were uh, covering sports gaming like the gaming tailgate and other people who have been around for a long time they'd be working with everybody and they were reaching out and there was definitely a lot of goodwill in that gesture but as time has moved on as it was as we've reached the influencer movement it's really about you know who will who will promote for us and of course back then they wanted us to promote the game obviously that's why they brought us in it was good pr but they always encouraged us be honest with your feedback be honest with your community and that's what i always tried to do now of course is there a, a certain amount of playing the game if you will you you, you are you're trying not to step on toe. you're trying to be honest with your feedback without uh burning bridges but at the same time you want to be honest with your readers or 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 viewers or whatever back in the day and and some of the some of the the shilling that goes on with the with influencers these days back in the day you would lose your following if you did that and when people say oh you're just bitter that you're not working with these companies i say well can you blame me i'm trying to be honest and that's costing me of course i'm a little bitter about about that well well, the thing is the thing is is it feels like the the influencer situation now is they will get they try to get all of the people uh who will play the game who will you know do basically what they're told to do as far as you know playing nice and you know promoting the company and promoting the game and everything um you know in the public space they try to get all those people under one roof well that's right right but, yeah and it's it's a lot of it now a lot of it now is in my opinion this is my opinion from an outsider kind of looking in and seeing what's been happening is it's getting as many of the people that they think that are already influencers or that they think are going to play the game and be uh you know uh 
a more influential person that will help them sell the game, getting them to, you know, be part of their system. And I want to point something out. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm really proud of the NLSC and what you and I do for content, Andrew, is that it's we 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 have stuck to our guns. We do exactly what we want um, with our content. Um, we stick to playing the games that we love, making content that we want to make. We do not, you know, hold back when it comes to critiquing the games, critiquing the companies, offering solutions praising the companies all different companies praising all different games we we stick to that and that's what i love that's what i want to do um but you know for anybody who has that frustration that andrew and i have had where we put together a super quality video um like uh, something high quality great gameplay or something with great narration um something that's super interesting and then we see a video with much letter, lesser quality from somebody who you know doesn't know the games as well as we do and everything and they just blow up and get you know 300 times the amount of views and interaction as we do a lot of times more than that i i want you you know if you get into those frustrated mindsets just remember why you're playing the games to begin with Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Why you're creating the content and always just keep the frame of mind that you're doing what's right and you're doing what you love. And that right there is is the most important thing. Oh, definitely. But beyond that, it is because, again, we, we always had to play nice to a certain extent. Like you get contacted by the rep and said, hey, the assets we just sent you for Live 07 accidentally show the new synthetic ball that the NBA hasn't unveiled yet. We need you to pull those screenshots or don't post them if you haven't posted them that's yet. Different. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, that's different. So there's things like that. And you do that because, A, you know, you want to st- keep in good standing with the company. B, you're not wealthy and you don't know <laughs> whether the lawyers are going to come after you and make an issue out of it. So you do that. And, of course, you do you are constructive with your feedback and you, you are honest with your audience. So it's that balancing act. And that was always the thing that I, I took pride in to be honest with the developers and honest with the, with, with the community when I was representing the community, because that was my role as going there to represent the NLC in the community, to be honest with my feedback and then be honest with what I reported back. And of course, if, again, if they say, look, don't talk about dynasty until this week, because that's when we're going to start unveiling the information. Then you can give your report on it again. That's just, uh, doing the right thing by the legal situation and the uh, agreement you signed, the, um, the non-disclosure agreement, to, to not disclose things until a certain time when it, when the, when it was approved. That's just the way it goes. And I also understand people wanting to work with companies because, and with those programs and being an, an influencer because, yes, you can make it into a career these days, but it also it is great for your content to have those contacts. So I totally understand that. But unfortunately, it has led to the the community being sold out the community being thrown under the bus when it comes to giving quality feedback to the developers or standing up for the gamers when it comes to microtransactions and things like that because you don't want to rock the boat you don't want to lose that access you don't want to lose those perks so you end up fighting with the company over your audience and back in the day that would cost you the audience these days it doesn't uh so it's it, that's that's always frustrating to me that i always try to do the right thing and yet it doesn't, uh, you know, whenever you try to do the right thing and the right thing doesn't seem to, uh, to pan out with uh, rewarding you for doing the right thing, it's always frustrating. But beyond, again, beyond the scope of my own content, b- being a community advocate and wanting to advocate for these issues and stand up for the community, I think that's what bothers me about the influencer movement as much as anything else, that that kind of stuff is, that, that kind of criticism is silenced and shut down very quickly. And I have no respect for anyone who flat out shills. It's one thing to work with a company, but when you're flat out shilling for them, I, I don't respect that content. Yeah. Um, well, I like your point of view, Andrew, and I like your content. Um, you. And you know that. Um, and I like connecting with you and playing with you on the games, and I love doing this podcast. Uh, so I want to point something out for anybody who says, well, it's more about the quality a lot of the time. I want you to think about the gameplay videos that you've seen during preview season for games and how frustrated you were watching that. I want you to think about the some of the most popular tweets and videos that you've watched, and you're like, man, this is just not good quality. Um, and that I'm talking about um, whether it be you know, sports related or non-sports related or video game related, or non-video game related, etc. I also want you to think about some of the music that you can't believe got popular, right? I want you to think about some of the absolutely terrible songs with terrible lyrics, um, with the most repetitive crap you've ever heard in your entire life that was made 
popular on social media that was pushed out in front of you right on Instagram or on Twitter or on YouTube. And I want you to think about the same for movies, absolutely terribly written movies with terrible plots, um, with really piss poor acting. Um, and you're like, how did this, why was this constantly promoted? Right. So the, all of that promotion got people in the theaters for that movie, right? It gained that audience, even though it was absolutely terrible. People were promoting that movie. Reviewers were promoting that movie. Um, you know, a bunch of blue checks on Twitter were promoting it, etc. So I want you to consider that when you say things, you know, along the lines of, well, it's mostly about quality and it's, um, you know, you got to hit the algorithm. Um, it's big picture wise. It's a hell of a lot more than that. And who promotes you, um, who's going to um, get you that audience is oftentimes um, one of the biggest factors um, in all of this as far as becoming like a higher follower account or higher subscriber count, um, you know, as an influencer. So I did want to put that out there. Um, but did you have any other comments on this? I, I, we've kind of taken a pretty deep dive into it. Um, I just want the community to know that we do love what we do and it's not stopping any anytime soon. I think the top 10 every single week because of the amazing submissions by the community and everything. I think that that should have thousands of views and hundreds of interactions every week because you guys have such great highlights. You're showcasing all of these different games. I think the NLSC top 10 is so unique in the basketball gaming gaming space. I don't think anybody's doing it exactly like we are. Us. And when I say we, I say you, the community, because the top 10 wouldn't exist without you as well so i want to let you know that you know i love you guys and um we are going to continue you know doing what we're doing here at the nlsc no i I definitely second that and i guess my final remark is we obviously will continue to do what we do because we we love it we we feel our advocacy and our commentary is is valid and important we want to put it out there because i do get the, the responses that say hey this this validates how i feel so we do know that there are people who share our opinion it may get shouted down at times it may not have the impact we want as far as changing the game, but we can certainly try. Something else that I've, I've been thinking about, you know, that uphill battle against microtransactions and everything, is that, yes, it's important to put it out there. Yes, it's, it's important to possibly stir up some controversy that may change the game. That's a long shot. It's worth doing for that. But if nothing else, it's worth putting out there to keep people informed and saying, hey, this is how much it's going to cost you to upgrade your player each and every year. This is the situation that you're dealing with. Is it going to change? We'd like it to. We're going to we'll push for change as hard as we can. It's unlikely. But you can be informed and know what you're in for. And that's why that commentary is important. That's why we'll continue to do it. Look, we have some things that hit the algorithm. That's always nice. But as you say, we have got some great, uh, great, great fans, great listeners, viewers, and readers of our content and uh, people who support the NLSE for many years. And yeah, we, we love them and absolutely appreciate them. Yeah, the, the critiques are absolutely necessary and more people need to speak up, speak up about unfair practices, period. Yes. That is it. I, I think that um, the more you let it go on and the less you speak up, the longer it's going to go on and the worse it's going to get. And we've seen that, you know, over the years and whatnot, especially with like the NBA 2K series. So no regrets ever about speaking up about that stuff. And I am always going to stick to my guns and be honest when it comes to um, that type of commentary. Uh, as far as uh, the the community goes, uh, one comment, when we get one comment on one of our videos, Andrew and I talk about it. <laughs> it's funny. We'll be like, you know, somebody will say, like Nate's comment on my uh, my team video, my domination video, where, you know, I mentioned it earlier, he stated that it's when he watches those videos, it makes him, you know, want to buy the game and play the game. Um, that meant the world to me. And um, Andrew and I talked about it. I talked to him about it right after you made that comment. So like, it means the world to us, you know, the Apple podcast reviews, uh, the comments on our YouTube videos, the Twitter interaction and everything. You guys are the best. And I know that the NLSC, um, content audience isn't as big as some other audiences for a lot of the reasons that we just mentioned but we love our audience and we love our community and interacting with you guys is awesome and that's the thing it may it's it's difficult to broach this topic without sounding bitter or 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 jaded or whatever but i I feel bad for king j mace though like right right like i mentioned king j mace like i feel bad for 
you know, King J Mace or Teddy Bear the Gamer who uploads videos and stuff like that. Um, there's other people who are part of our audience that are content creators, and and I feel for them, and that's why I wanted to bring up King J Mace as an example. Oh, oh for sure, there there are many. It's people, just not fair. Yeah. There uh, are many people who deserve much more views and followers than, than they have, and and you know we will love, happily work with them and promote them as, as they do our content as well. As, as I said, though, it, it's difficult to to not sound a bit bitter or jaded about bringing up these topics. But I guess my final thought here is that I'd much rather, be, and we've, we've talked about this before off air, that I'd much rather be making content that we enjoy making, that we're proud of, that we're interested in making, and that is not selling out our fellow gamers or throwing them under the bus than doing something that would go against our principles just for popularity. Because we have an appreciative audience and I'd much rather cater to that audience that will appreciate our content that we also have that passion for making than anything else right and i find the bat that the nlsc is content wise is very unique in the basketball gaming space like going through our youtube looking at all the videos that we upload looking at the conversations on the forum looking looking at the different modding sections all of that stuff when it comes to nlsc content i find it to be the most unique um and i think most awesome I mean, I, I love what we do um, in the you know basketball gaming space, so I'm proud of it. But that is something that we wanted to discuss, as we alluded to last week. But we will finish up with a, uh, a fun topic here as we uh, open up the mailbag. To the mailman, the pump face. What an unbelievable dunk! So I asked the community, you know, in 2022, how many hours roughly per week did you play? basketball video games and i thought this would be kind of interesting to throw out there because we got you know gamers that are in school uh we have gamers that have full-time jobs uh we have people with big families i know like the goods um tg so good i think he um i think he has i think he's married he has multiple kids etc um so like I was curious how often people in our community were actually able to enjoy these games. Yeah, I mean, what we obviously have talked before about how we completely disagree with the idea that, oh, gaming is just for kids, and that if you if somehow have something wrong with you if you're an adult playing games, but certainly when you are older and you have other responsibilities, a full-time job and whatever, then it, it does get in the way of uh, all leisure activities. Yeah, and a lot of people in our community are in their 20s, 30s and there's many people a lot older than us in their 40s and 50s playing these games i'm some that are prominent modders on the nlsc um some that i connect with on parsec and whatnot and play these games so it's definitely the nlsc community is made up of all ages and whatnot of basketball gamers so i think that's really interesting as well well i mean we've got uh jeff x in the forum who is uh in his 60s and actually witnessed the he's a a uh, very hardcore Knicks fan from New York and actually witnessed the Knicks uh, sold championships in the uh, 70s. I love his Knicks commentary in the NLSC, in the basketball section of the NLSC because he is a hardcore Knicks fan. And you can tell when he's so frustrated with the team. And, and they've given, uh, they've given him was, reason to. <laughs> just as, just as, right. Bulls, this as Bulls management has given me reason to uh, uh, be frustrated over the years. But yes, he's got it. I think he might he might win that battle, actually. Yeah, I, I know that it's hard for him uh, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, actually longer than that, 20 years now with the Knicks because he was there for, like you stated, the, when they won their championship with Walt Frazier and, and Earl Monroe and, and Willis Reed. And then, you know, he was also there for um, the 90s when the Knicks were excellent in the late 80s, you know, with Patrick Ewing and whatnot. So he saw some great Knicks years. So I'm sure like the last 20 years have been frustrating for him. Well, when you put out the question, it got me thinking because I haven't really uh, tallied the hours, I guess. Uh, I'm guessing between uh, content creation and uh, connecting with you and, and my solo play, uh, maybe a, a couple of hours a day so at, uh, you know, on average. So yeah, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in the 20 hour part. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. You and um, I want to say Nate, Stasho and the yeah. Oh, one, yeah. He, so you're right on par with him, and I know that him and Roger have been playing a lot. And I'm I'm actually a little bit more. I think I think I'm around the 35 40 hour range mm. um, per week. 
And it's it, part of it is because my brother lives with me. One of my brothers lives with me and we're playing pretty much every single night. And my girlfriend's super cool with it, which is awesome. Um, she'll actually hop on the basketball ga- video games with me sometimes. Um, she's played Jam OFE with me. Um, she's played NBA Hang Time, uh, NBA Street. You know, she's, she likes those types of games. Um, so she's actually been in the top 10 a couple times as well but um because i live with my brother um and because we play co-op on so many different games um and head-to-head and whatnot that's really ramped up the amount i play each week yeah it'd be interesting to actually count the hours maybe next week when i do that just to actually see how many uh that i do play obviously i i have my uh my day gig and everything and uh and other responsibilities or you know go going out with friends and uh and whatnot that does change in your 30s obviously when people get married and <laughs> have kids and so forth you uh, you don't go out like you used to but yeah it's uh, I, I need to put a figure on it but uh, I, I know it's probably at least 20 uh, per week and and again people would might look at that and and, uh, and frown at that and, and say there's a problem with it but again how much TV are people watching a week and if that is how you unwind that's that's how you unwind. Right. I've talked about this before. Um, there's people that binge watch on Netflix, like they'll watch every season of Dexter or something. Right. And then they'll move on to, I don't know, Grey's Anatomy or something like that. And they'll spend countless hours on Netflix or just watching different shows or movies and everything like that. Or, you know, they're, they're, maybe their face is stuck to the news or something like that. Like, um, I don't, you know, talk bad about those people. Yeah, so there's no reason for that or look down on those people for doing that. So really people shouldn't look down on gamers who, you know, are having a good time and oftentimes like with me it's a shared experience and whatnot with my brother, you know, having fun with video games in an interactive way and everything like that. I mean, we're basketball fans as well. You watch a few games per week, that adds up in time wise. Games, right, right, games exactly. and, well. yeah. Yeah, you know. and I have NBA T V on in the background. Over the last two months, two or three months, I've had NBA TV on the back uh, on in the background all day while I work because my job I've had to work from home over the last couple of years because they closed down our office in 2020. So I have get my dose of real basketball watching full games um, and the highlights of games and whatnot every single day. So combine that with all of the video game basketball. It's just it's basketball, basketball, basketball most of the time you know, where I live. And yes, as you said, uh, Nate Star Show uh, says 20 hours a week. That's the Live One legend, of course, along with uh, Roger. Uh, at, the, at the other end of the scale, you've got uh, Chuck at ChuckLA92 says about five hours a week. Yeah, I, uh, before we move on to Chuck, uh, I want to say that, again, super proud of and of Nate and Roger, the Live One legends, for what they've been doing with their YouTube channel. I just looked at their subscriber account and it's grown by about 50 over the last couple of weeks. I think they're up to like 254. And it's really cool because these are two guys that are doing what we discussed earlier. They're just playing games that they want to play and they are having fun playing those games and they'll upload the footage that they want. So like NBA live 2004 fantasy draft footage or MVP baseball 2005, or maybe mad no eight or mad no nine. And then they'll do the dunk contest from NBA live 2005. Um, they obviously still upload NBA live 2001 footage. So I just want to say that I think it's awesome. And I think you guys are awesome. You've been regular guests now on the NLSE podcast. And I just want to keep seeing that subscriber count go up for you because you're doing what you love um 250 subscribers doesn't sound like a lot for some people but for the fact that you guys are not promoted um and you know by big influencers and whatnot you know every single subscriber for you guys is just fantastic um for chuck five hours a week i would say you know for a lot of people with busy lives who love basketball gaming that's probably more in line with the norm that is my opinion. I would say five to 10 hours per week because you got to think about it. Five hours per week would be what? One hour per night on a Monday through Friday thing. Or maybe, you know, a couple hours during the week and then three hours on a Saturday or during the weekend or whatnot. I think Chuck LA, that's probably a healthy amount for him if he has, if he has a busy life. And we've got a reply here from Teddy Bear the Gamer at 317 Teddy Bear on Twitter, of course. Uh, man, honestly, I've been playing 2K23 for about three hours every day. Really loving the My Era mode. It's more enjoyable this year because I didn't have to make full rosters arenas. And also says he loves the uh, the retro effects in uh, My NBA Eras, which, yeah, is awesome. Yeah, he's been super into that. And I want to say, though, that he was also 
a big time contributor to the NLC top 10. And I got hundreds of highlights from him, I want to say, last year um, when 2K22 was the current title. I know that he was using the college rosters that were made for that game and doing a lot of college gameplay. And I always loved seeing that because it was something different, something unique, something that you don't see uploaded too often, especially when it comes to the newer NBA 2Ks. So um, I love that he was in, that he's into my NBA eras. Um, I knew he would be when that was announced and everything because I know his gameplay style. And he was in the top 10 this week, actually, with a Pippin spin move on the Knicks and a huge throwdown right up over the defense and whatnot. Um, he's definitely been a loyal supporter of the top 10 and our content and everything, and I really appreciate his highlights. And finally, we have an interesting perspective from uh, Easy Madden 25. Uh, it's uh, Samuel, of course. Uh, hours with a basketball video game running on my PC versus hours spent playing basketball video games and the infinity symbol for the former and for the latter beyond zero and this is something that does happen in our community being a modding community as well as a gaming community that there are people who do spend more time modding than playing the games i replied to him and stated that stance and that style actually makes up much of the modding community because what they're doing is they're creating amazing art for the game um and they love doing the art creation and then seeing what it looks like in the game and then share um, and then sharing that artwork with the community. And for them, that's more enjoyable than the actual gameplay, than actually the actual on court action than actually, you know, starting a, my NBA or my league or, you know, getting involved with something that's going to take them a long time on the actual virtual hardwood um, from a gameplay perspective. So I think that does. And I think that's, there's nothing wrong with that. And they're actually able to tap in to that creative side. And I think that um, I've been that way at times with certain games where I didn't like the gameplay that much. I think NBA 2K21 was an example where I was like, you know what, I'm going to make some cyber faces for the community. I think you remember I made like the mask and whatnot, and Hellboy, and of all course, of that yeah. stuff. Just some, some Apollo Creed, Rocky Balboa, all of that stuff. Like, I created a bunch of faces for the community, and I didn't really play that video game that much because I wasn't very fond of NBA 2K21's gameplay. But I wanted to do something fun from an artsy perspective. So I see where he's coming from, and I love modding myself. However, his example of you know how much he plays versus how much he mods, um, I'm probably the opposite of that. I am constantly on the virtual hardwood on these video games playing them i love this the the season aspect of video games of accumulating stats i love using roster mods that are created by the community and whatnot and jumping into a my league or a my nba uh or a season when it comes to a, a, you know an older nba live etc i love playing co-op with my brother on the various games i love playing arcade hoops games so i'm probably the opposite of him but i do love modding and i do get it I can definitely relate to it as well. I know the last few years of making rosters for the last few NBA Live games, 2005 to 08, because I was maintaining those uh, updates simultaneously because I knew how to convert them between the games, so it made it much easier. I w at the time, I wasn't playing those games as much, or I was playing Live 06, but I was playing My Dynasty, which already had rosters and you know, in place from that save. So I wasn't necessarily using the what i was making i was making it for the community because there was still great interest in that and it was an artistic uh, as you say it, it was creating art in a way it, it was a form of artistic expression and uh, creativity creative expression so that's why i was doing it but i was spending more time with those games modding than i did, than i was playing them so it's also interesting to go back and play them all these years later and spend a bit more time with them not just modding but yeah i, I definitely know where he's coming from there and it's it's definitely not uh, uncommon in the community. Uh, the uh, Doctor Toboggan and uh, hook, uh, Hookup Guy actually uh, co-sign that uh, co-sign that remark. So yeah, we, we we definitely know what happens. Yeah, and without the Hookup Guys, without the Doctor Toboggans, who by the way made an amazing Charles Barkley cyber face for one of the newer two Ks, and I actually was able to convert that to two K nineteen. He'll be in the credits. He just he does awesome work. His cyber face work is top notch. Um, but without the Dr. Toboggans, um, the hookup guys, 
the Peps who does jerseys, um, the uh, Mickachetti's uh, for the 2K19 rosters who does the art for the shoes. Uh, without the you know the IM Escobar Lopez, he hasn't been um, active on social media, but he without his cyber faces, uh, without Razor before he went to work for 2K, without his work and whatnot, um, you know a lot of these roster mods wouldn't be possible. Right. And I use a lot of these roster mods to enhance my gameplay experience. So like the people in the community making all of these emit this amazing art when it comes to jerseys, courts, cyber faces, arenas, something like Dorna's enhancing the basketball stanchion and whatnot. Like all of that adds up to a more immersive experience gameplay wise. And there's such a variety of mods because of all of these great artists in the community. So thank you you know, for spending that much time on the art for the video game and, in, and adding new art and enhancing the art that's in the game because you've definitely enhanced my experiences with these games. But thank you to everybody who responded to that mailbag prompt and uh, keep those answers coming. It'll be interesting to see uh, how much time other people are spending on the virtual hardwood. So yeah, let us know. Absolutely. And I also want to say, I know that this was a little bit longer of a show, but I appreciate the community for tuning in every week and listening to us talk about basketball, video games, and everything. I, I hope you can tell that we love it, that we love getting on the, on here every week and you know discussing everything related to basketball gaming and our experiences with it. Um, but yeah, longer show, but it was a lot of fun. Well, it's like we always say, uh, passion should always drive content creation, and that's uh, that's that's what you'll be getting from, from us moving forward and always. But uh, with that being said, that has brought us to the end of this week's show. As always, we thank you for tuning in and invite you to join us again next week, either on the MLSC our YouTube channel, or your podcast app of choice. In the meantime, please connect with us on social media as well. That's where you can get in touch with us and, of course, stay up to date with all this content that we've been talking about. So, Derek, go ahead and plug the handles. Absolutely. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter where I'm the most active at d for 3 g and at d for 3 84 preferably connect with me on both. I am on YouTube, d for 3 I'm also uploading a bunch of content to the NLSC YouTube, so as stated at on the onset of the show, please uh you know check out that content and i am on the nlsc d for three i am andrew in the forum and andrew nlsc on twitter the nlsc is on twitter and facebook at the nlsc our instagram is nlsc basketball we're on youtube at youtube.com slash shambi live series center and of course give a look to the nlsc itself mb-live.com for everything we do for basketball video games so thank you once again for tuning in and until next time i'm andrew and I'm Derek. Go get buckets, everyone.